have your Bibles, I invite you to turn back to that passage in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 23, with our Bibles open in front of us, I simply remind you what the Bible is. It is God's Word. God speaks to us through the Bible. Let's pray and ask Him to give us the ears to hear Him. Our Father, we come to You as a people who have been loaded down with so many benefits. We would live in a nation where we have been raised in a context of education that we can read, that we live in a nation which still has freedom for worship, that we live at a time in history and speak a language where the Bible is available to us to read in our vernacular. You have kept this book down through centuries when multitudes of evil men have tried to remove it and that you speaking through it. Lord, we are loaded down with many benefits. And for this one that is right now before us with our Bibles opened, we pray that we would embrace it that we would have hearts of worship as we sit before you, word, and you speaking to us. And so we ask then, we, we cry out and entreat you in the name of your Son, that you would give us ears that we may hear your voice, that we may know the ministry of the Holy Spirit amongst us, glorifying Christ, taking the things of the Lord Jesus and making them plain and clear to us. Work, we pray, in terms of salvation and sanctification in our midst. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible records some wonderful stories of sinners being saved by God's grace. And they are stories of great encouragement for us as Christians. People who, who once mocked and rejected Christ... But God comes to those people in his sovereignty and and he transforms them by his power so they then begin to trust in Christ. They become recipients of the salvation of Christ. Those very people we read about in the Bible, saved by grace whilst on this earth, they publicly confess Christ in this world and those people have died. And right now as we are here, They are in the presence of Christ. Well, one such story, friends, is the focus for us this morning before we come to the Lord's table. He who is often simply called the dying thief. In what we call conversion at Calvary. And it's perhaps surprising that we would even think that. We think of Calvary as the place where we look to and get converted. But I'd like us to see this morning that at Calvary itself, There was a conversion. In this passage and in other parallel passages of the Gospel, we see three things that relate to this story. The rejection of Christ, the confession of Christ, and the salvation of Christ. Think with me firstly about the rejection of Christ. Here in Luke, in his account, he takes us to Calvary. He takes us, you know where that is of course, to the side, the city of Jerusalem. And he shows us that there's more than one cross. We often think of the cross. And right, that we do. But he shows us there were three crosses. If you look with me in your own Bible at Luke 23, you'll see that's recorded by him in verse 33. When he says, And when they had come to called Calvary, there they crucified him, the Lord Jesus, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now the Romans deliberately had their victims crucified near major roads. 
They did that mission to intensify, increase the shame and increase the ridicule on them as they were dying by crucifixion. That aspect of where Jesus was and people walking by doesn't so much come out in Luke's account, but it does come out in Matthew's account where it talks about people passing by. If you just turn with me over to to Matthew's account, we'll just duck across there for a few moments in Matthew 27 before we come back to Luke. And we see this scene described by Matthew in Matthew 27 and he says this in in verse 38. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Here were these people... It seems just walking past the crucifixion scene. Perhaps they're part of the the, the increased number of people in and around in Jerusalem and these very days because it's the peace. There's lots of people coming and going. And here are some people passing by on this Friday morning there at Calvary. But as they pass by, Matthew shows us that they have words to say against Jesus. He tells us that they're wagging their heads, they're shaking their heads, and and they're doing that, if you like, as an outward expression of their contempt and their disgust. And we know something of that. You know, when you're really disgusted about something or someone, you sort of just shake your head. There's a sense in which that's what they're doing as they're walking past Christ, a sense of disgust and, and contempt of this one up there on the cross, especially the Lord Jesus. These people, who are they? Well, they very well could have been some of the people because of what they go on to say, who they had heard Jesus teach recently in the temple. And they seem to take Jesus' words, they use Jesus' words, and of course they, they twist them, they use a twisted version of words, and they try to use those words and throw them back in the face of the Lord Jesus. They're ridiculing him. And of course in their blasphemy, what are they doing? Are they accepting Jesus? Not at all. They are rejecting him. But it's not just ordinary citizens involved in this rejection. We stay with, he goes on to say in verse 41, Likewise, in a similar manner, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, he saved others himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Now the men who said those words should have known better. They, they, they were men who were known for being worshippers of God. But they were clearly display a rejection of Christ as well. Luke goes on and he tells us that the Roman soldiers were involved in the rejection. We know that already, don't we? I mean, they were the ones involved in twisting up and making the crown, the, the crown of thorns. They were the one who put the mock on the Lord Jesus. They were the one involved in the mock coronation of the King of the Jews. And they're the ones, even at Calvary, who are engaging in rejecting the Lord Jesus as well. Before we go back to Luke, notice one more thing that that Matthew records. Who else is in Jesus in verse 44? Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So those who hung on the cross on either side of Jesus, they, they joined with the words spoken by all these others. These common criminals, here's one on the right hand side, here's one on the left hand side of the, of the Lord Jesus. They are displaying, as they die, they are displaying their wicked hearts. they got no respect for the man between them. Here they are, those men on either side of the Lord Jesus, they are there, like Jesus, in absolute physical agony. And in their physical condition, it would have mean it would have been very difficult for them to breathe as they were dying by crucifixion. That means it would have been very difficult for them to speak. 
but to find enough strength, they find enough breath to join in saying these words of rejection. It's like they say, Amen, with all the others who are joining in to sing this same song. So can you see we have like a, at, the, at the scene of Calvary, we have a universal chorus. We have ordinary people walking past. We have those who are standing near the cross. We've got the religious ones. We've got those who are working on that day at the cross, the Roman soldiers. We've got those on either side of Jesus on their own crosses and they're all united in their rejection of Christ. All of this hostility, this enmity is being heaped on the one who hung in the middle cross there at Calvary. What does it all add up to? It is rejection of Christ. Friends, isn't that the same chorus that is being sung today? It is true that there is much division in our world, there, are, there, are, there is division in marriages, there is division in families, there's division in political parties, there's, there's division between nations in our world. But, but, but as we see this, it's this which seems to unite the entire world. Rejection of Christ everywhere. And I would submit to you rejection of Christ even within the context of Christendom. Rejection of Christ not, not, not only as a phenomenon in Jesus' day in the context of religion back then, but rejection of Christ the man and his work is right today in the context of religion. People may be very happy to sing songs about Jesus. Glad to benefit from the great care from the people of Jesus. People who may be very keen and they like to take the advantages that are associated with the true church of Jesus. They may gather each Sunday to sit with true followers in the worship of Jesus. But when it falls down to many of their lives, they actually personally reject Christ. Christ is not their Lord. They are not following Jesus. Him in their lives. Many like a superficial style of Christianity where everything looks sweet on the outside. But if you put your ear up to their lives and you listen, you hear a resounding message, a personal rejection of the person and the work of of Jesus Christ. What are their hearts for? Well, their hearts are for anything and everything else but Christ. They may have hearts that are that are very excited about their sport. They may have a, a focus that really is primarily their, their 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 hobbies or their pets or whatever it is, their interests. It, it, it isn't actually really Christ. They do not love his kingdom. They embrace his priorities. They do not live out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not committed to his church. You see what I'm saying? Like the religious ones in Jesus' day, there is, sure, a superficial impression. All boils down to what there is really in their hearts, in their lives, a rejection of Christ. You know, that's what it is for all of us. Unless God's grace comes to our self-centred, stubborn hearts and changes us. And that is clearly what we see happen at Calvary. We turn back to Luke chapter 23. We see that Luke highlights the ongoing animosity between uh, toward the Lord Jesus, but he is in on one of the criminals. It seems like there's a passage of time that's passed. Perhaps some hours have gone, and now there's mainly just one voice. They're coming from the cross context. Luke 23. 
39 says, Then, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. That there came to a point where one taunting evidently turned to silence. One of them now is silent. Because Luke tells us in verse 39 that one of the criminals said this. He thinks he is speaking for the other when he says us, but he's not. He's just speaking for himself. One. The tense of the word that Luke uses when he says then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed. That, the tense of that word blaspheme actually reveals that this, that this man, he kept up ridiculing. He kept going with this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And all the while the other man now continues to be quiet. So there in that scene with Christ in the middle, there's one man on one side constantly, constantly, constantly ridiculing and rejecting Christ. Whilst now the other one remains silent. What has brought about this change, fellow? Was it that, 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 that Jesus never responded to any of these horrible things saying, being said against him, that as he watches and listens on and Jesus does not retaliate, that that had an impact on him? Could it have been that he had just heard that, that, that Luke records in verse 34 when Jesus says from the cross, a, a prayer if you like, said out loud, Father, forgive them, the soldiers around me, what they are doing. Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Could it be when he heard those words that he was so overcome with the fitness of the Lord Jesus in a situation that he himself was going through the same Had the sinless dignity of Christ had a melting effect upon this man's hard heart? It seems all that while all the heckling had been on and continued then to go on by this other criminal, that the grace of God was quietly at work in the heart and in the life of this other man. You see what was happening, though we can't see it. If we draw back the veil, we see the conquering grace of God was subduing his rest. Stubborn heart. The sovereign power of God was changing his defiant and stubborn will. Now, how can we say that? Well, think with me now, secondly, as we look at confession of Christ, as we come into verse 40 in Luke. Because he says, he tells us, he makes it really plain that the other, the other criminal, the other man on the other side, answering, rebuked him. So you see now this real contrast that Luke is setting up for us between these two men on either side of, of the Lord Jesus. Here's this as he and maybe strains as much as he can being pinned to the cross to try and look around the other side of Jesus to address the man who's pinned on his cross on the other side. And yet his heart is no longer full of bitterness. It's no longer full of hatred. It's no longer full of selfishness. He understand who he is before God. And we say that because of what he goes on to say and what he addresses this other man by saying in the end of verse 40, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation. Don't you fear God? I now fear God. You see what's happening here, what has already occurred in his heart, the grace of God had begun to teach this man what it is to fear the Lord. And he knew that his fellow thief hadn't learnt this. Due to his newly found godly fear, he himself could no longer ridicule and reject Christ, you see. He rightly understood that to mock the Lord Jesus stems from a root cause of a lack of the fear of God. And yet whilst this fellow had breath, and out of, out of love he tries to persuade his fellow partner in crime to learn godly fear while he yet could. But also due to his fear of God, 
Blessed of God, he could understand not only who he was before God, that meant he understood his guilt. Look what it says in verse 41. What else does he go on to say to the other fellow? He says, we indeed justly, in terms of condemnation, we are justly condemned, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. So here, what's he doing? He is openly confessing before all that, that, that this one in the middle on the cross, that, 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 that he needs to recognize how different was men to the one in the middle. We deserve condemnation. See what he's doing? He's confessing his sin. He's acknowledging his personal guilt. He did it openly. He did it very publicly. It's a public place. This man, he confessed sins not only before his fellow criminal, not only before those around him at the foot of the cross or those walking past, but most importantly, he confessed his sin before Christ. You and I are guilty before the Lord. We deserve to die of our sin. He could say the wages of sin is death. But then he also confesses something else at the end of verse 41. But, and here's the next contrast, but this man, capital M, and this one between us has done nothing wrong. And so now he openly confesses before all who this one is who is in the middle cross. This, this Jesus is innocent. We certainly deserve to die, but not this man. He's done nothing wrong. He says, can't my, my sinner friend, Jesus isn't dying for his own sin. He didn't have any. It can only be that he is dying for the sin of others under the righteous justice of God. How can you ridicule such a one as this? You see what a change. The grace of God has wrought in this man's heart what grace does, what it can do and what it still does do. We see what he even calls Jesus, how he even addresses Jesus in verse 42. He then turns his attention to the Lord and he says to Jesus, Lord, not rabbi, not teacher, And the legitimate titles in themselves for the Lord Jesus. But he addresses him with the title of his majesty. Lord. And also this man acknowledges that Jesus is a king. That Jesus has a kingdom. Acknowledges that, doesn't he? In what he says when he goes on to say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus has a kingdom. Who's the one that has a kingdom? Who's the one that possesses a kingdom? The king does. It's his kingdom. And so you see, this man, his heart is bowed in humility and submission before the king who is nailed right next to him. Here we have his humble, public confession of Christ. And and we're watching on, aren't we? We are witnesses to this scene of this man's public confession of Christ through the pen of Luke. Wonderful. To be a, a, a witness to someone confessing Christ? And that's what we'll do this afternoon. And so I want to say to you, don't miss it, friends. It's a means of grace for Christians. The Lord Jesus instituted two ordinances. The Lord's Supper for the Christian church. It's a means of grace for Christians. The second ordinance is baptism. Instituted by the Lord Jesus. It's a means for Christians. It's a means of great encouragement for God's people to witness a public confession of Christ. It does good to our souls. Think of this scene. 
Think of the good they've done to the souls of believers, those women who were around the cross. Think of what this did to Mary. She was there. She knew who Jesus was. And here in this most agonising hour for Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus, there's some good happening for her. She sees this sinner confessing Christ even as her son is dying. It does good to our souls to witness those who confess Christ. You see, God wants us to witness others confessing Him. It's a powerful testimony to the grace of God as this scene is. It glorifies God as this scene no doubt did for those who were there around that cross. What impact even this had upon one of those Roman soldiers, we don't know, but it probably was what the Lord did to use to convert a Roman soldier. We're taken to this scene through the inspired pen of Luke. We're witnesses to someone confessing Christ. And friends, our Lord wants the noon's public confession to be a powerful witness to his name. And so I just want to encourage you to come, to bring your children for the sake of their souls. Is there something more important that you have got to do this afternoon than that? Being a witness, especially to a young person testifying and being baptized, has a tremendous impact for the Lord. In the context of our culture, a culture that is constantly rejecting and ridiculing Christ, to have an opportunity to witness someone stepping up and confessing that they are a sinner, confessing that Christ is their saviour, that is not only rare, it glorifies God. It strengthens saints who are watching on. It has a powerful impact for those who are not yet saved. And that's why I want to encourage you to come. So why would you not come? It won't be a late night. I don't think you go to bed at 6.30 or 7. What else is on? TV? Movie? That's all fake. This is real. Like this account of a real sinner. Confessing Christ before others. Rejection of Christ, confession of Christ, thirdly, finally, salvation in Christ. Again, we look at firstly the words of the man as he addresses the Lord Jesus in verse 42 when he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. When you come into your kingdom, this guy seems to understand that entrance to his kingdom is not based upon his own efforts. He's understanding that if Jesus doesn't do something in me and for me, there is no way that I'm going to get entrance into the kingdom. The entire basis of his request for the Lord is, is, is rest down of his understanding that it's not Based, he can't get into heaven based on his own efforts. He knew that the Lord Jesus was his only hope for salvation. Now what about his request when he says, Lord, remember me? Was he asking, Jesus, please don't forget me? What did he mean when he said, Lord, remember me? If you see me tomorrow going into the bank to withdraw money. And you call out to me as I, as I step up to the counter and you say, hey, remember me. I wonder what you would be asking. Are you just simply saying, oh, don't ever forget about me. No. You're saying, your statement's loaded. You've got something else in mind when you say, remember me. Well, in the same way, uh, think of this dying thief, what he meant when he said, remember me, Lord. He meant far more, Lord Jesus, never forget about me. 
He had something else deeper in mind. You know, we actually read a similar expression in the Old Testament in relation to Noah in Genesis chapter 8, and it tells us that God... But Noah, what does that mean? Does that mean that God went through a period of time when he forgot Noah? Of course it doesn't mean that. Now, there was a period of time when it might have looked like he'd forgotten Noah. I mean, he's tucked away in that, oak, in that ark, he's for months. Had God forgotten him? No, Moses wants us to understand God remembered Noah. What did that mean? God actually made a provision for, for Noah's deliverance from the destruction. And so Genesis 8 verse 1 says, God remembered Noah. He goes on to say, God made a wind to pass over the, and the water subsided. In other words, God removed the curse from the earth, that punishment due to sin. God remembered Noah. That is, God made provision so that Noah could be safe or saved. God sent his wind, which only God could do. And here in Luke chapter 2, this man effectively says, Lord, Lord Jesus, make provisions for me. Save me. You alone can do it. You see, just as God made provisions for Noah, just as as God sent his wind to deliver Noah and his family, we know, don't we, God sent his only son to earth to die that right there next to that man. The dying son of God was the means of deliverance for this needy sinner. Lord, remember me. Lord, make provision for me. Deliver me, I pray. Save me. And as he prays, think of his prayer was in the process of being answered. God was making provision for him. And you. And me. Through the death of his son. We come into verse 43. We come to the high water mark of the passage. This is glory. Verse 43. Jesus says to him, Assuredly, I say to you, assuredly, that's, that's like I have something extremely important and very serious to say to you. These are solemn, weighty words. Now, today, you will be with me in paradise. Where, Lord? Paradise. Paradise means a garden filled with delight, effectively. Paradise in the Bible is another way to describe, or it's another term for heaven. And we know that in, in 2 Corinthians 12, when, when Paul talks about a man who was caught up into the third heaven, he also describes that same place, the third heaven, as paradise. And our understanding, our Bible knowledge of the expression third, that's a reference to what we commonly call heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven is where you see the stars. And the third heaven is God's dwelling place. Heaven, as we commonly call it. And so Paul understood that paradise and the heaven, or heaven, it is the same place. That place of exquisite delight. It's the place of God's presence in glory. And what's he say? The Lord Jesus says, you will be with me. Well, that settles it anyway. <laughs> You'll be with me in paradise, with me, uninterrupted communion with me. That's what you're going to have. With me, with me, with me. So it's, not about your, it's not about your husband and wife. As much as we love our husbands and wife and when we look forward to heaven and what that will be, it's not about them. Yes, they'll be there if they're believers. I'm not trying to denigrate that. But it's with me. It's with Christ. The focus. With me. Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise. You're not going to some dark, distant, some dark, distant future after you have spent a period of time in probation. Purgatory. Oh, you've been such a bad sinner. You've been a criminal, you've been a thief, you've got to spend time there. No, there's no such place in the Bible. Purgatory doesn't exist. It's a, it's a made-up doctrine of the Church of Rome. If purgatory is true, then surely this man would have needed to go there. But what does Jesus say? You'll be with me in heaven when? Today. When 
you die, you're not going to go to soul sleep. You're not going to go into a state of unconsciousness in your soul. But before today, you will be with me immediately in a conscious state of fellowship in heaven. Your body will go to the grave. But your soul will be transported immediately into my presence in paradise. You'll be absent from the body, but you'll be present with the Lord. Isn't that the hope of every saved by God's grace? Isn't that our hope when we die? Isn't that the great comfort for many of us who have had previously saved sinners as our loved ones? And they've departed and they've died. Hope, absent from the body, absent from us, but present with Jesus. Is that your hope? It's only for those who have turned from their sins and are trusting fully in Christ. You see what this is saying? You must be someone, someone far more than who just sings songs about Jesus. You must be something, there must be something about you that is far more than just you partaking of the blessings that come from the church of Christ. You must be, there must be something about you in your life and in your heart that is far more than you meet on Sundays with the people of Christ. You yourself must know Christ. You must be a seeker after Christ trusting in Christ alone as this man did. But hasn't Jesus forgotten some things that this guy sort of needs to do? I mean, what about his baptism? When's he going to have an opportunity to be baptised before the day's out? He's on the cross. When's he going to go to church? When's he going to take the Lord's Supper? When's he going to be able to do good in his community? This passage shows us clearly you get into heaven by free grace. Not because of your baptism, not because of your church membership, not because of your church attendance, not because you're good in the community. This incident that we look at here provides one of the clearest examples of the truth that salvation or justification happens by faith alone. This man obviously had done nothing to earn his salvation. Isn't that so? He knew he deserved condemnation. His salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And this man had no hope of doing anything anyway. And so what does he do? Nothing in my hand. Simply to the cross I cling. He throws himself on the mercy of the Lord. And that's where he's saved. And within a few short hours, he's going to be with Jesus in paradise. Just as Jesus said. It's a tremendous gospel story this is. It's almost like a surprise story to find this at Calvary. Conversion at Calvary. It's a story of a spectacular story of God saving grace. Think of this man though. He was on the brink of the hell. A few small steps away from going over the edge and never stopping in his descent. The bottomless pit. You see the nearness of eternity for It's so with us. Heaven and hell are not places far away. You may be in heaven before the sun sets today. Likewise, hell's flames, hell's mouth is wide open and waiting any moment to receive those. But for this man, the grace of God opened wide the door of salvation through the death of Christ. If there was ever a case If there was ever a situation of a person who lived on planet Earth that seemed lost, he seemed like past recovery, it's this guy. But God is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him through Jesus Christ. 
The Lord was willing, the Lord was able to save completely this man and he is willing and able to save today. You see, no one is beyond the reach of the grace of God. No one is too sinful. No one far gone. No one is even too close to death if they've got consciousness. This passage directs all sinners to the God of grace, to free grace. But friends, let us never forget that there were two crosses beside Jesus. Let's not forget that. Two responses to God's gracious salvation. One sought Christ for salvation, the other went on ridiculing Christ. One turned from sin, the other was hardened in sin. One was taken to heaven when he died, went to hell when he died. And yet both were very near Jesus. They were very near Christ and yet one accepted and the other rejected. Friends, Christ is near us here this morning under the preaching of the Gospel. On which side of Christ stand? Not a third way. You either accept His grace or you reject it. You either turn to Christ for salvation from your sins or you die in your sins and you meet Christ in judgment. There's no sort of middle way. Well, I'm going to try my best and that I hope will be good enough. No, it's never going to be. When you die, you and I will either be taken to heaven or we will sink in hell forever. And this passage points everyone to the God of grace and that we each must be saved. Can you see now that an external, superficial, a Sunday best type of Christianity, that type of Christianity where I, oh, I love to sing the song. But in the reality, I live my life as one rejecting Christ. That religion will take you. You can be so close to Christ, like the other criminal, and still end up in the lake of fire. Don't be like him, young people. Don't be like him, older ones. What do you and I deserve? We deserve condemnation and death because of our sins. But Jesus didn't deserve to die. This man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. He didn't deserve such treatment. What about us? Hell is what we deserve. We don't deserve or are not entitled to a place in heaven. But we can praise God that there's a middle ground. The majestic Lord of the universe who laid aside his glory stooped that low for us. He humbled himself to the point of the cross. The sinless Jesus on that cross took upon himself all the sins of all of those who would believe in him. So that turning from our sins and trusting fully in his finished work, we too might be forgiven. Not through anything that I might try to do, but through the virtue of Jesus' own shed blood. You see, friends, conversion, Calvary, a hell-deserving sinner was saved. Oh, just in the nick of time. For the day's end was out. He was in glory. And there's the hope for you and me. Your, my conversion all centres on Calvary. His blood was shed to wash away all of sin's filth. There's a fountain, is there not? Remember last month? There's a fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's vein. Open. It was open for this man. And so I trust this morning we can sing those other words of William Cowper when he says, The dying thief rejoiced to see the fountain in his day. And there have I, as vile, vile as he, washed all
Oh, our Father and our God, we come to you this morning to give you our praise, to worship you together as a people, that you are a God of such astounding grace, that you could save such a rebellious and hard and cruel sinner so near you, one who didn't deserve in any way salvation. We thank you that that is what you have always been like and that you are like that today. We rejoice, we who are your people, in the salvation that is ours through this very same one. And We cry out to you and call out to you in the name of that one. Be many others, even those who sit amongst us, who yet may know this glorious salvation by grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.